Today we'll be looking at creation. I believe that I was created in the image of God. So it was very good. It's a testament to how proud he was of making mm. all of this. I, I believe by faith, God has created this world. Welcome to the I Believe presentation series. My name is Donovan Grigg, and I'm so glad you've joined us. Let us open with a word of prayer. Dear Lord, I thank you for the opportunity we have to consider your word. I pray that your Holy Spirit would guide us and teach us as we consider our topic today. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Today we'll be looking at creation, God as our creator. There are a number of big questions in life that people ask, two of them being, where do we come from? And also, what is the meaning and purpose in life? And I believe understanding this particular teaching that we'll be looking at today will help us answer those two questions. So the Bible begins with the foundational truth that God is our creator. Right here in Genesis 1 verse 1, the very first verse of the Bible, the Bible states, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And I believe it was intentional that this is the very first verse in the Bible God revealed to us as our creator. Now, this foundational truth that God is our creator is affirmed throughout the rest of the Bible and on which many other biblical concepts are founded. So this understanding that God is our creator is foundational to a number of other things that we believe. As it is stated in the book Seventh-day Adventist Believe, the doctrine of a divine creation, that is a creation by God, forms the indispensable foundation for Christian and biblical theology. I would like us to explore the Bible's teaching on God as our creator in this presentation, this study, and also some of its practical implications on how this understanding will impact our view of God, ourselves, others, and life in general. So as we get into our Bible study, I would like us to start right in the beginning with cre the creation account as recorded in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. Now, Genesis chapter 1 and 2 provide the authentic and historical account of God's creation of our world. Actually, if you read Genesis chapter 1 and 2, they are, these are two reports on the creation of our world. The first report is found in Genesis chapter 1 from verse 1 all the way to 2 verse 3 and provides a chronological account of God's creation. It records God's creation of our world in six literal days and then God's resting, blessing and sanctifying the seventh day as the Sabbath of the Lord. The second report found from Genesis chapter 2 verse 4 to verse 25 describes man's place in God's creation, focusing on that particular aspect. So as you read Genesis chapter 1 and 2, I invite you to consider these two separate reports on creation, that, that although it is in two chapters, they together they help us to make sense of God's creation of our world. So I would like us to look at that chronological account from Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 to 2 verse 3. And I'll be summarizing it for us. So on day one, God created the light and divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. 
you'll see on the screen where that can be found. Genesis 1, verse 3 to 5. Day number two, God created the sky or the firmament and separated the waters above from the waters beneath. And he called the sky or the firmament heaven. Day number three, God gathered together the waters beneath the sky into one place and then the dry land appeared. He called the land earth and the waters he called seas. God then also on the third day created the grass, the herbs and the fruit trees for the earth. In summary, what we find on the first three days is he formed the earth. He formed these, these particular spaces and from day four to six, he now fills them as we will see. Day number four, God created lights in the firmaments of the heavens to divide the day from the night, to be for signs and seasons for days and years, and to give light on the earth, as we read in Genesis 1, verse 14 and 15. Then God made two great lights, referring to the sun, the greater light, and the moon, the lesser light. The greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. That's Genesis 1 verse 16. And I'll be using the New King James Version throughout this Bible study. Then on day number five, God created the creatures for the water and also birds for the sky. So he filled those spaces. And then on day number six, God firstly created cattle and creeping things and the beasts of the earth. We find this in Genesis 1, verse 24 and 25. And then as the crowning act of God's creation, God created man in his own image. Male and female, he created them. He gave them dominion over every living thing and provided their plant-based diet for them. So God also, if you read the, the second um, report on creation in chapter two, he also gave Adam the responsibility of taking care of the Garden of Eden. If you read Genesis chapter two, verse 15. Now something beautiful we find in Genesis chapter one is God's emphasis that what he created was good. There was no defect whatsoever in what God has made. God is a perfect creator and what he created was good. And this is evidenced in the many times that God declares in Genesis chapter 1 that what he saw after he had created it was good. Let me read some of these verses to you or some portions of the verses rather. Genesis 1 verse 4, after God created light, it says, and God saw the light that it was good. Verse 10, referring to the earth and the seas, and God saw that it was good. Genesis 1 verse 12, after creating the grass, the herbs, the trees, and God saw that it was good. Genesis 1 verse 16 to 18, having made the two great lights and the stars also, and God saw that it was good. Verse 21, after creating the sea creatures and every living thing that moves in the waters and, and the winged birds for the skies, and God saw that it was good. Over and over, God emphasizing that what he created was good. Verse 25, after creating the beasts of the earth, the cattle and everything that creeps on the earth, and God saw that it was good. Six times in Genesis chapter 1, emphasizing that what God had made was good. And then this climaxed in God's view of all that he had made in the statement um, in Genesis 1 verse 31, after seeing all that he had made on these six days, it said, then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. So what God created in the beginning, when God created our world, he created it very, very good. And then on day seven, God ceases his activity of creating and institutes the Sabbath day. As Genesis 2 verse 1 to 3 records, thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had done 
and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Now God didn't rest because he was tired, but I believe he rested, he ceased his activity in order to spend time and to enjoy his creation, to spend time with Adam and Eve. Verse three says, then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it or set it apart for a holy use because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. So here we find in the beginning, God also setting up our weekly cycle, six days to labor, and then on the seventh is the Sabbath to spend time in fellowship with God. So having opened with God as our creator, the Bible reaffirms this truth throughout the rest of scripture. So in the beginning, God is introduced as our creator with the creation of the world. But this theme is repeated over and over again through the Bible. And I would like to share a number of scriptures with you on that theme of God as our creator. The first one I would like to share with you is in the 10 commandments, in the fourth commandment, we find reference to God creating the heavens and the earth and everything in them. It says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. And here's the reason why, as we read in Genesis 2 verse 1 to 3. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So the Sabbath is a memorial of creation. It reminds us that God is our creator. Makes me think that if people had observed the Sabbath right from the beginning, every seventh day, they would have never, they would never be an atheist. They would never be someone who doesn't believe in God because every seventh day, there would be a reminder in the Sabbath that God is our creator and that he wants a personal relationship with us. Psalm 19 verse one also speaks of God as creator in these words. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. We saw that in Genesis chapter one when God created the firmament and also filled it with the birds of the sky. This is his handiwork. Psalm 33 verse six and verse nine also powerful verses confirming what cre the creation account in Genesis one says. Psalm 33 verse six says, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. Thinking when God said, let there be light and there was light. God can create when he speaks. Verse nine says, for he spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. Psalm 95 verse six talks, tells us about wh whom to worship and we need to worship our creator. It says, oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. God alone as creator is worthy of our worship. Isaiah 45 verse 12 also speaks as, of God as creator in these words. I have made the earth, the Lord says, and created man on it. I, my hand stretched out the heavens and all their host I have commanded. Verse 18 of the same chapter says, for thus says the Lord who created the heavens, who is God who formed the earth and made it, who has established it, who did not create it in vain. Beautiful. Who formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is no other. A number of times in the book of Isaiah, God compares himself as the creator with these so-called gods, the idols. And he says, there's no one like me. So God being created distinguishes him from any other so-called gods. Acts 17 verse 24 and 25, moving on to the New Testament now, speaking of God as creator. God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshiped with men's hands as though he needed anything since he gives to all life 
breath and all things. Beautifully put. Life is a gift from God. God gives life, breath, and all things. He is our creator. Then Hebrews 11 verse 3 sounds similar to Psalm 33 verse 6 and 9. And it says, by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. So that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. And then coming to the last book of the Bible, Revelation. Revelation 4 verse 11 tells us why God is worthy. It says, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. Why? For you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. What a blessing to know that we are not here by random chance or chance evolution, but God has created us with purpose. We are here, we exist by God's will, and he created us. And therefore he is worthy to receive glory, honor, and power. And then Revelation 14 records three important end time messages that God has for the world, for our time in earth's history. And the first message that God has Part of it refers people back or calls people back to worship him as creator. John the Revelator writes, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. This is a worldwide message saying with a loud voice, Fear God or respect God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. And we know going back to the 10 commandments that God is the one that the same sort of terms are used in the 10 commandments. And again, referring us back to creation. We need to worship God who created us, who created the heavens and the earth. And we also need to worship him on the day that he has set aside. So as we summarize this message, I would like to read the fundamental belief on creation. Number six, it states, God has revealed in scripture the authentic and historical account of his creative activity. He created the universe and in a recent six day creation, the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. Thus, he established the Sabbath as a perpetual memorial of the work he performed and completed during six literal days that together with the Sabbath constitute the same unit of time that we call a week today. The first man and woman were made in the image of God as the crowning work of creation, given dominion over the world and charged with responsibility to take care for it. When the world was finished, it was very good, declaring the glory of God. And I hope in this study that you've seen that to be true from the Bible itself. So let's move to application. Here I would like us to consider what are the practical implications for our daily lives of knowing God as our creator. What difference can knowing God as our creator make in how we live our daily lives? And I believe there is much practical implication for us knowing God as our creator. And I look forward to sharing this with you. So we'll look at these practical implications in terms of how we view God, how we view ourselves, how we view others, and how we view life. So let's start about start looking at how this impacts, how knowing God as our creator impacts our view of God himself. We view God as our creator, and this distinguishes him from any other so-called gods. God says, there's no one like me as the creator. There is no, no other gods or so-called gods that can compare with me. And this is an antidote to idolatry. Now, you'll see the reference below there. There's a, a chapter in the book, Seventh-day Adventists Believe on Creation, and the, the specific section called The Significance of Creation. 
If you have the book, I encourage you to read through that section. I'm, I'm drawing a lot um, from that section on these implications. It's beautifully put. Isaiah 40 verse 25 to 26 says, To whom then will you liken me? Or to whom shall I be equal? Says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these things, who brings out their host by number. He calls them all by name, by the greatest, by the greatness of his might and the strength of his power. Not one is missing. So God himself distinguishes him from other gods or so-called gods by means of him being creator. Psalm 96 verse 4 and 5 also speaks to this when it says, For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. Why? For all the gods of the peoples are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Also, thinking of our, how creation impacts our view of God, we view God as our creator and therefore as the only being worthy of our worship. Romans 1 also speaks to this, where we are not to worship as created beings, to worship any other created being or thing. Only the creator is worthy of our worship. As we read in Psalm 95 or 6 earlier on, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. And lastly, on our view of God, we view God as our creator and as a personal God who desires a relationship with us, as is evidenced beautifully in the institution of the Sabbath. For me, when I think of the Sabbath, God created the world in six days, created Adam and Eve on the sixth day, and then the first full day that Adam and Eve experienced was the Sabbath, the seventh day, where God spent special time, I believe, with Adam and Eve. And so this testifies to me that God is not a distant God who created us and wanted us to carry on with life, but he created us for a relationship with himself. How does creation impact our view of self? As beings created in the image of God, who have been given a special place in God's creation and have the privilege of a personal relationship with our Creator, I believe we should therefore view ourselves and others as special, valuable, and of great worth to God. Genesis 1 verse 26 to 28 records, Then God said, Let us make man in our image. Nothing else in creation was made in God's image, but man, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So we were created in God's image, special. There was, that distinguishes us from the animals, and we were also given dominion over um, the other parts of creation. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And then verse 28 says, Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. We have a special place in God's creation. Moving on to how this understanding of God as our creator impacts our view of others. We view God as creator, as our ultimate father, and all humanity as his children, thus making us brothers and sisters. If God is the one that created us all, that means that we can relate to each other as brothers and sisters. Um, our fellow human beings are part of the same family. And we should therefore treat each other well. Listen to Malachi 2 verse 10. Even though I think this is referring to God's covenant people, I think the principle can apply. It says, have we not all one father? Has not one God created us? Yes. Why do we deal treacherously with one another? By profaning the covenant of the fathers. We have one God who is our ultimate 
heavenly Father who created us. Also thinking of our view of others, we view ourselves as beings created by God for relationships with each other. It's part of how God created us, not to, be, to live in isolation from each other, but to, to relate to one another, to have friendships um, as social beings. So God created us for relationship with Him and with one another. We also can view others as fellow human beings created in the image of God, and we thus treat others with respect and dignity they deserve. When I think of how to treat others, I need to remember that this other person has also been created in God's image. James applies this in James 3 verse 9 and 10, and he says, referring to the tongue, with it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. So he's saying, how can we curse someone else who's been created in the image of God? And then lastly, on this aspect, we view God as the designer of the marriage relationship between one man and one woman. Thus, also the designer of the family unit. And we thus recognize this to be a model instituted by God himself for humanity right in the beginning. So we find when God instituted marriage, when he brought Eve to Adam, he instituted this model for humanity of marriage and the family. And one of our fundamental beliefs speaks to that, marriage and the family. So we recognize that this was God's design. And I believe that whenever we align ourselves with God's design, in whatever aspect of life, including this one on relationships, when we order our lives according to God's design, there is blessing there for us. And lastly, how does creation, understanding God as creator, impact our view of life? We view life as a gift from God, and therefore we value life and seek to preserve it. We view life in this world as created by God with a purpose and with meaning, and therefore in relationship with our Creator, we seek to discover and fulfill the divine purpose in our creation. As we relate to God, as we get to know God as our Creator, He can reveal to us, and through God's Word, what the meaning and purpose is for our creation. We view ourselves also as beings belonging to God. He created us, and we are therefore stewards of the physical, mental, and spiritual faculties that He has given to us. We need to um, preserve these faculties. We need to develop them to, to offer God the best service we can and to be a blessing to others. And then lastly, we view ourselves as stewards of the earth, referring again to Genesis 2 verse 15. And we therefore recognize the need to be responsible stewards for our environment. We are responsible for what God has entrusted to us, and that includes this world that we live in. So in closing, in light of the Bible's teaching that God is our good creator, who alone is worthy of worship, and who desires a personal relationship with you and with me. In light of the Bible's teaching that life is a gift from God, that both we and others have been created in God's image with a divine purpose and as stewards of ourselves and the earth, I invite you to view God, yourself, and others, and life in general through the biblical worldview of creation, through the biblical worldview that God is our creator. And then not only to view life that way, but to seek to live life in harmony with this revelation and ultimately to fulfill the divine purpose in your creation. That is my prayer for you and for me, that we can fulfill the purpose for which God has created us and get to know God 
as our creator. Let us pray together. Dear Lord, I thank you so much for the blessing it is to know that you are our creator, our good creator, who created us with purpose and meaning in life. Lord, I pray that we would count it a privilege and a treasure to know you as our creator. Please guide us and lead us step by step. Please teach us more about your plans and purposes for our lives. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, friends. Thank you for joining us. And I'm sure you've got questions or even comments. Please feel free to send an email to the email below or reach out to us on any of our social media outlets. We are so, we are so glad to have you interact with us and we are praying for you as you discover what you believe.